Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Hey, gang, welcome to another episode of Weird Web Radio. This one, unfortunately, I have to say, is the COVID edition. Before we get into anything else, I want to tell you that I and my family have been fighting off the COVID virus. Um, For me, currently, November 23rd, as I record this, is day 10. I could have been cleared from isolation today, but with honest and integrity, I told the health department how awful COVID just reared back up to life and started really kicking my ass the last day and a half. Unfortunately, it seems that that's what COVID is really good at. Um, For a lot of people out there and making you think you've just about beat it and then coming on extra strong I'm feeling much better today and I'm looking forward to being released from all this isolation and my family feeling good and everyone's doing well at this point so I thank you for any of the concern you're feeling and for everyone out there who's currently fighting this terrible virus you know my heart and my thoughts my prayers and even magic out there is with you I guarantee it Um, for everyone else, please be careful, wear a mask, don't ignore the things that are right in front of us, let's beat this thing together, okay? Now, in this episode, I'm finally going to get to the good news, I'm talking to Meredith Graves, and Meredith is one amazing individual out there, she's got this way, this tone, that makes you feel immediately as though you're talking to your best friend, and her in-depth knowledge and awareness of the things in the occult and her own practice that she's willing to share are nothing short of incredible as well. Uh, from Meredith's bio says that she's a lifelong practitioner of witchcraft and magic whose enthusiasm for the art permeates her career and cross-disciplinary creative practice. She's a musician an author and a lecturer whose recent history includes two years as the host of MTV news in her current position as a community outreach director for Kickstarter, which she gleefully admits is covert money magic all damn day. And I like that. Um, you'll, you'll definitely get a sense of that humor from her as well. Uh, I did want to address something in the show, a couple things. I make a little comment about six ways, not really teaching you anything new. Uh, maybe for me, but uh then even then that's not true uh, six ways is the most incredible book for any beginner out there and i think it offers a ton for any fundamentally you know skilled practitioner too um and i'm sure everyone gets that at this point from this show also there's a part where we start talking about our favorite scenes in horror that involve magic i don't know what the hell i was thinking by not coming up with what is actually my favorite scene and uh, not that what I mentioned isn't great, and you'll hear that, but my favorite scene for that is in Constantine the movie. Now, that movie didn't follow the comic very well, or at all, really, but it was still good. Uh, that scene where they go, he goes to midnight, and he wants to you know, get you know, visions of hell and figure out what's all going on, and they use that electric chair. That's just too badass to to pass up. I I love that one. Uh, Anyway, that's enough of me rambling, as I've been prone to do throughout these days of isolation. So uh, by the time you all hear this, I'm either still being quarantined, I am getting better, or I've gotten better. And I appreciate, again, every bit of support that has come my and my family's way. Without further ado, here's Meredith. Stay weird out there, my friends. Okay, we're recording. Meredith Graves, welcome to Weird Web Radio. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's very lovely to be on your uh, show. Awesome. And uh, extra special thank you to Aiden Walker for introducing us. Uh, that man never fails to amaze me on his level of friendship. <laughs> we should, maybe we should just take a moment to talk about, even if briefly, Aiden's new book, I can't say enough good about it. And if we're just going to jump in feet first to the topic of people and things that are great, weaving fate, what an accomplishment, right? Yes. Uh, I had the honor and privilege of being part of that creative process with Aiden. Um, He sent me one of the earliest, ugliest 
<laughs> portions of that book that ever existed, incomplete chapters and so on, just wanting my thoughts. And I went chapter through chapter, and I was just one of the, I think, three or four people he chose to do that, which was really cool. Um, what he created, I think, and we covered this on my last show with Abe, that I think is so unique and powerful about Weaving Faith that I think is important for everyone out there, is he he gave you a manual on how to create the hyper sigil that everyone's talked about Grant Morrison doing with the invisibles, but this is much more accessible to anyone. That's my opinion. Hyper sigils, hyper sigils. It, it, it is the right time for, <laughs> <laughs> for the modern magical discourse is like a thing that people, like that's a possibility you're encouraged to do it here's one way of doing it in the form of a journal thank you <laughs> but i think yes. this, this is the perfect time to introduce people to the idea that taking on a long form and free form creative project just for yourself can also be a magic act that's really really cool aiden is cool it's a cool book okay. <laughs> I will uh, vouch for that. Aiden is one of the coolest, baddest motherfuckers I've ever had a privilege to call a, a, a brother in every sense of the word that means anything. So, yeah, very cool way to start the show. Go by Weaving Fate. You've got my stamp of approval. Now you have Meredith. What else are you fucking waiting for, people? I love, I love books. <laughs> I love books. I love, I love to read. I love magic books. Um, and I love them. I love them even when they're kind of wonky. I love them when they're a little crooked and when every couple pages you got to oh, set it down for a second and walk away and take a breath and like check it, remind yourself that you don't only, you're not just on this earth to read things you agree with and then you can go back to the like That one is just a permanent fixture. That's, that's like a master. Like, <laughs> that's like having <laughs> the joy of cooking. It's like you can, yeah. pick, it up, you can pick it up and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's cool. Uh absolutely uh his book six ways changed i think changed the game so well and it's strange too it's, it's not like he taught you anything new in six ways if he put it together in a way that said you don't have to have 12 12 different books and four different websites and that audio program anymore to get the effect both effective practical techniques and have a bullshit detector when you go exploring everything else like in this little thin volume of badassery. So now it's the required first required book for anyone that I teach. I think it's, it's a really good introduction. I like, I like the larger function of that book. And I think weaving fate does the same thing differently. And I think I've read a couple other books uh, from modern magical practitioners and authors over the last few years that also do this. And I'm not, I'm not going to have quite the right words to this, but Sometimes magic books are magic books because like their larger purpose is to kind of try and explain magic or make it accessible in one weird way. I like books that do this other thing that evokes for me more thoughts of short exploratory philosophical texts. I'm thinking of, you know, people like Barth and, and Baudrillard who would just pick an angle, take it on and go hard for the duration of one book. Right. Mm. It's like it's like you're dropping into a philosophy class taught by an expert sorcerer, not like you're having magic explained to you. You know, you're like uh, stepping into the shoes of a sorceress Baudrillard type. It's it's interesting for that reason. It's first person without any directive. And I think that's yeah. cool. I like books I do. Like that. Yeah, I like that. And since you wanted to start with books, we'll start with books. Um it's no secret. Uh, every once in a while, I'll ask a certain guest, and I don't know what inspires me to do this, but I think you're the perfect person for this because it it gets dodged even when I ask it in ways it doesn't open up. Um, and this comes straight from you. I this is a this is a quote of yours or a tweet that you shared or something that you were really a fan of. I dug out my research, and it boils down to this: bad books. Opposing views, ideologies that make you sick. That reflects something that I often think about, um, especially in the world of like runes and heathenry, right? Yeah. You have questionable people at best sometimes who are often sought sources for information, whose ideologies and worldview in their lives, not necessarily always in their published work, even though it leaks in there at times 
makes people want to say, never buy that book, never read that book, don't have anything to do with those people or their work. You are saying drink from the poison well, right? Very much so, yeah. (laughs) To be quite quite blunt, sola dosi facet veninum, you know, the dose makes the poison, as you do. As you do, yeah. So as you do. Let's 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 think back over, you know, maybe the last couple of years. What what sort of poison well did you drink from that you came back with useful information, even though it really made you sick to do it? Oof, there's so much. And that's <laughs> there's so much. There's so much. I'm a sh- I'm a husk of a human, you know. <laughs> the world is a terrible, terrible place. Uh, the world is absolutely abysmal at all points in history, at all strata of human life. Uh, whether we're looking at this from a sorceress purview or through the lens of contemporary global politics, or with a myopic lens on the pandemic, you know, we could take this anywhere we want to take this, right? But there is something to be said truly for, well, I think, okay, so maybe right now it's actually a lot easier to explain this, right? We've all just been observers to varying degrees of a political cycle where willful ignorance annoyed a lot of us. People who, despite what's clearly going on around us, that there's hard evidence for, go, nope, everything is great. You know, America is great whatever, all of that nonsense, this sort of uh, people that, despite the rising death tolls, refuse to wear masks. And I'm not saying people who don't believe in science. I'm saying people who are unwilling to accept what's directly in front of them. We have just gone through, like, a a speedrun version of what that can do to a culture. And if you can get it there in the public and social sphere, you can get it in magic. So overlap that onto the magical world and you will very quickly begin to understand why it's good to read the bad books, right? Like, so you know, so you have a really good sense of the outlook and the skills known or that are, you know, attempting acquisition by the bad people. You always want to understand where the bad people are coming from. You got to know what they're thinking when they look at you. You got to know what their end goal is, you know, this isn't, this isn't necessarily native to magic. You know, this is how we do project planning on a corporate level when you're, or try to reach any audience for any project. You know, you have to think about who's the demographic. Why would you not want to know? What do you gain by not knowing is always the question that I ask. And it's a good question because sometimes the answer is nothing. I don't even know about that. That seems super unimportant. <laughs> and you can always get back. But like the badder something is, the bigger and the badder something is, well, I personally, I always want to know the exact size of the beast. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, I always want to know, like, as thoroughly and from as many angles as possible, exactly what we're up against or possibly up against. To me, reading the bad books, and I hope that this metaphor doesn't sound cute, or maybe if it does sound cute, it's so cute it enrages you politically, <laughs> or something like that. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. To not read the bad books is to go out eating wild mushrooms. You know, you can just be walking along, popping wild mushrooms in your mouth, and you can't tell them like false. Mo- <laughs> you can't tell them. Every mushroom has a false version that will kill you with the quickness, right? Like if you don't read the field guide, if you don't make an effort to learn subtle nuance differences right so like i have if you're if you have two texts available to you that kind of elucidate the the ability of sorceress purview to permeate politics and one is gary lockman and one is like well now i don't even want to cite any authors that the other book might be because i don't want to give them the <laughs> airtime. you know what i mean you got to be able to pick the right one right which one is the the false morale or the false moral of the story. What's the false moral of the story here, Lonnie? You know, you got to know which one won't kill you in the end. So I think that's why it's important to read the bad books. Like, like, and I just think that if people would still want to make an argument against that, coming from a magical position, like, okay, drop your counter argument on me. But there's like, there's only a few. How do I want to put this? This might sound silly. It's like, 
if in your magic or part of your magical practice, you are on some level trying to interact with <laughs> spirits or energies, I guess to shorthand it, or any sort that could be frightening or scary or that mm. you would need to cast a circle around yourself for to protect you from because you were that fearful of like what they could do to you. You're probably doing more research on the front end before you ever go in working with that thing. Like if something scares us, we research it and we come prepared. And if we can do that with demons, we certainly can do it with like, I don't know, proud boys. <laughs> and where they overlap is a place that sucks and is way closer than we think. So yeah, that's why I think it's important. I want to know what these sorceress chuds are up to. I want to be able to, I want to, be able to spot them from 20 paces. Yeah, I know. And I agree. I agree completely. I, I always tell people, you know, like if you if you're worried about supporting an author or that it's especially if they're living the buy the book used or find the PDF really piss on their, you know, <laughs> their income in some ways. But you can't you can't discount ideas just because you disagree with someone on fundamental principles of living. You still may find what you need to know, even if nothing more, like you said, to spot them from 20 paces, I think is a great way to, to approach that subject. Right. And also just like to take it from a totally different angle that, that need not sound so menacing because, you know, menacing again, that's an important part of it. Dealing with demons, dealing with humans. There's also something to be said for if you're on this track already getting off of the track where you think you can only learn things about, magic how you do it how it works like learning anything about magic exclusively from quote-unquote magic books like everything that you read and everything that you take in whether you agree with it or not whether you love the movie or not whether you cook your way through the cookbook or you pick and choose a couple different recipes like you could still learn something from it i think a lot of people go into a lot of things trying to uh, ask a question of does the acquisition of this knowledge in some way enrich or complete my identity or my sense of self like well if not then throw the whole thing away you know it's important mm -hmm. to diversify it's not just reading the bad books it's watching bonkers eight millimeter movies you know it's it's cooking your way through you know some vegetarian thing from the 70s you've never seen it's taking up a new hobby you know all these things important to magic so it's mm. just it's, it's just straight up good to diversify and try new things, even if only to learn that you don't like them. That's that's expansion. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think this leads nicely into a question I wanted to ask you. I, um, are we pushing the boundaries of magic far enough as people who practice and study magic? Are we expecting enough out of it yet? And if and if we haven't for you, what do you think the edges of that possibility looks like? That's a really interesting question because <laughs> I don't think the boundaries of magic are anything we remotely have the ability to contemplate, let alone access. <laughs> I think the point of doing magic might be to trance the boundaries of humanness in a lot of cases. And I don't mean yeah. like, I don't mean merely the astral plane. I mean like Aiden, well, Aiden talks about this a lot, like social deconditioning. Magic helps with social deconditioning. I mean that part too. Um, I think that on par with that, how to expand our sense of how magic is, well, okay, here's one way that I can take this. One way to expand our sense of what's possible and to expand like the magic that we're doing here is to become more culturally literate. Um, a lot of people might stop at the first few magic books again. And especially people that are new to it, they might stop. Okay, I've got some witch books and I'm going to go through them. And first I'm going to visualize them, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Without taking stock of what they already have from uh, literal or figurative cultures and subcultures that they come from, that they're part of, the stuff that's already around them and within them, right? Like not seeing magic as something you have to find and add on to your life, but as something that's already present literally everywhere else. You can go find it wherever you look and that can be comprised of stuff you already have that's something that i'd like to see i'd like i'd like people to stop like looking for an ideal of magic in a singular text or tradition and instead start to see the plurality of examples and cultures that have existed still exist 
are apparent that overlap that that maybe exist only in fictional texts. You know, think about the magic you've already encountered that's colored your depiction, the one that got you to here at the point where you're interested in doing it. You know, I think pushing the boundaries of magic uh, can be done very effectively by learning more about magic, how it works all over the place in every point of history and every point of culture. You know, so that's a nice way of thinking about it, I think, for an individual. <laughs> as For an individual, one way of pushing your boundaries in terms of your understanding of magic, yeah, I think it would be to become more literate across the board, to become like well versed in in lots of ways that magic is happening. And you know, <laughs> very quickly, you will lose interest in attempting to determine boundaries. <laughs> <if you're anything laughs> like but I I think about Saturn a lot. I go out to the to the far edges and see how how much further I will never get. So maybe I'm <laughs> actually the wrong person to ask that question of. But. That's that's a valid that's a valid um, a way of looking at it, especially perhaps it's that Saturn kind of vibe you're put off that that led me to want to ask you that question anyway. <laughs> There's just like all it's all limits, man. <laughs> it's all limits, man. It's all that's, limits, man. That's not on a t-shirt yet. It will be. No. <laughs> <laughs> that can be uh, exclusive for your patrons one. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're not on that part yet. Oh, um, man. Yeah, we're still on the public view. <laughs> All right. Um, man, so many directions. I want to take this conversation with you, and you give me so little time. You monster. <laughs> Which brings me to another quote. Right. <laughs> um, I, I've I've read in places where you've written about how you were called a monster, and it was like it was this came part of your identity in a way growing up uh, and there was this really intriguing way that you said something in I think it was a vice article you wrote and you said survival often depends on difference and you follow that up by saying you know you're being your own kind of final girl what is it about horror in the way that it delights you how does that survival that you're talking about depend on difference as it shows up in magic. If that question makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I think it actually, it not only does it make sense to me, it makes sense really directly in the capacity of like Saturn magic among many other things, but like that, uh, that sort of horror. Well, there's horror and there's horror of philosophy. <laughs> to be really, really, really pedantic about it. There's horror and horror philosophy, and both of those things have deeply informed me, like as a general human, as a human of magical brain, I guess, maybe, on my, on my better days. <laughs> um, the horror and Saturnian connection is, is one that perpetually fascinates me, and it's not that way in the way that a lot of people might, <laughs> I tend to think uh, a lot of people have a conception of Saturn, and of Saturn magic as being, it's Saturnine if it's creepy, and if it's dark, and if it's and if it's got to do with blood and guts and murders, it's Saturn. Like, okay, yes, to an extent, all those things are true. But I'm really interested in horror in terms of what it kind of is based on in terms of limits. So maybe this will answer the way that I think about this what, uh, question of why I put so much of my love of horror into magic. So like, okay, we're trying to cross boundaries, for example, right? Well, mm -hmm. our ex like we're already pretty used to and comfortable with the i guess new age platitude of like every person's experience is individual to their perspective and that their outlook on life is totally your own and we're all just individual beings having this unique like complete experience right and really we're experiencing like 0. 0.000 repeating one aspect of what's actually going on with quote unquote why we are alive and horror breaks that boundary quite literally by tearing our bodies open and showing us all of this stuff through you know recreation and depiction that is actually the reason why we're alive for up until the point where we can't answer that question anymore so like having to face down something that we perceive falsely as a limit aka the external skin facing of the human body actually having that torn open and having a feeling our own revulsion and experiencing our own shock at having another layer of experience peeled back through secondhand depictions and horror like coming up close to that and having that 
reminder when it's not actually happening to you and you're not laying on the ground like actually wounded and you're watching depictions of it you're being reminded that you're victim to a false boundary every moment that you're walking around feeling real complete in your skin suit right and so there's there's like a whole other conversation there about like what it's like to be a chronically ill person who is more reminded of that on average and there's a sub conversation about depictions of illness and horror a little scary conversations are happening right now but in general i think yeah um especially if you are doing the kinds of magic and i won't be prescriptive and like assign that because it's saturnine magic there's a ton of things that that across all traditions and all points in history where you know necromancy across the board in general where magic is found when you push your face up against the corpse and the thing that terrifies you and that's present you know again it's in magic it's in philosophy it's in it's in art it's in depictions you push your face into death and you see where the actual limits are like you sit there and you get nauseous and you push through the limits as you're watching it you you are forced to recall all of these things about these occulted processes that are happening within your body to an extent and that's a that's a toughening exercise in a way but i think i think horror in that immediate gut check way no pun intended sorry um hmm is a it's a horror movie is a hyper sigil a horror yeah. movie is a hyper sigil it's a cracking the uh usually some sort of ripping tearing and or, organ consumption sometimes like monster movies you know <laughs> it's a reminder that even the boundaries of reality uh you're you're making more comfortable boundaries for yourself than you really have and the, they remind you that whether it's through you know a horror movie with aliens or monsters coming up from the deep or just even again just like that tearing open of the body and the exposure of the processes and viscera inside it's reminding you that you're operating on levels of reality and that there's possibilities beyond what you are immediately experiencing out your face you know that possibility <laughs> That horror forces you to confront in this visceral mythological way um it's the modern like 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 micro super empowered five hour energy shot of saturn magic <laughs> <laughs> Watch something really violent and be reminded of it and then be like whoa <laughs> and then be like whoa <laughs> and, then, and then be like whoa sometimes that's the way I, that's all i've got when it comes to explaining magic sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Does it make sense? Like, and oh yeah, and then there's the horror philosophy aspect, right? Which is actually like, if you read the works of people like Dr. Eugene Thacker, who was profoundly lucky to interview one time actually and talk to him about this. This is an idea that's present in a lot of magical traditions from the earliest days of like people philosophically and theologically trying to define consciousness. But it goes all the way up through and includes, and this is like a major theme of the horror of philosophy, Lovecraft who himself spawned a bunch of like magical traditions and different stuff, but it's horror philosophy being the idea that there's a world without us that we can't conceive of and we'll never know. And the limits of experience have denied us the potential horrors of all that we can't perceive. Right. And so like, that's something that comes from horror literature and is present in horror films and in horror philosophy posits a whole way of thinking about, you know, the ontology of human existence. But it's also, of course, present in the horror aspect of all of those things. And that's, you know, this idea that there could be anything outside the realm of my perception because my perception is limited. It's a whole, the horror philosophy, but it's also like the underlying base structure of magic. So that's mm. also very interesting to me, of course. That, that's an interesting way to put it. I, I'm thinking back on my own earliest days getting involved in the occult. And one of the driving factors for me to pursue magic had to be intimately tied up in my obsession with horror when I was young, especially uh, what would I do if I suddenly encountered this thing from another world? And if the gun doesn't work and the knife doesn't work and that I only need that, that ancient grimoire, where would I find it? And what would I do with it if I had it? You know, those sorts of things I think did, have an effect driving me towards magic to begin with. Yeah, and depiction. Another thing that I'm actually the, the, the utter reverse of this <laughs> conversation <laughs> is like I also just love the occult and magic and witchcraft in the movies. I love the history of the the, the absolute like you cannot have cinema or media without 
magic. It's like the first and most important forever plot point of everything. But there's also this, I, I've done a little bit of writing about this actually for Fangoria, weirdly enough, which is really cool, uh, about the thing with movie magic and the history of the earliest days of cinema and this idea of like how the Lumiere brothers sent people allegedly running out of a theater screaming because they thought the train was going to come off of the screen. Like it's like some Ian Kelly shit, right? So there is a, a, a explicitly occult lineage of cinema. And I love, love sometimes in huge air quotes, like cinematic depictions of, of witchcraft and sorcery. That's always so cool. It's so fun to see. <laughs> what do people think it is? <laughs> how do you how do you put this? Like I have trouble talking about it. How do you put it into images? And what if those images then flipped around and done for magic? You know, this is cool. This is cool stuff to think about. It is fun stuff to think about. I'm I'm like you. I'm all in. I generally love any depiction of it in the cinema, from the cheese to the mind bending. And there's not a lot of mind bending. I don't think really in cinema there, are, there are a few though <laughs> there are a few mind-bending pieces like what do you, what do you think of that is good yeah that's 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 a valid question um i i really don't know if i consider anything to be a great depiction of like how i see magic playing out one of my favorite things in recent history though was uh penny dreadful's first season when she's reading tarot and the way she approaches tarot and, and, and how it interacts with the world around her as she's dealing with not only like a werewolf, but a de the devil and so on. She's surrounded by all these mythological badasses in, in a way that you just, it, you and I might actually both want to have those real intimate kind of connections to things like that and be afraid that they would be that real, that imminent and that physical at the same time. I enjoyed that depiction. I think mm -hmm. I thought that was good. How there's about a, you? There's a show. <laughs> I'm sitting here. <laughs> I got a few. I got a few in pocket, but there's there's a TV show that I. It was it was literally a perfect synchronicity. I think I found out about it the day it before maybe it was announced that it was being canceled after two seasons. I would personally <laughs> fund the bringing of this show back and it only ended recently it's called lodge 49 have you seen lodge 49 no but guess what oh, i'm what? gonna do soon <laughs> i dare you i challenge you lonnie to not watch the entire show in like a day and a half two seasons oh. of lodge 49 and this is my favorite thing that has been on tv recently and it is the single most nuanced cool hysterical depiction of a magical order that I have ever seen because it's effectively it's it's supposed to be about like an, an, a Masonic or an Odd Fellows type organization and the guys who in this year are still part of those sorts of fraternal orders and it, of course it's I believe it's really closer to like Odd Fellows or the Lions Club because there's women involved and it's like a, a very general organization but it's about the lives of these people who are members of a social fraternity that has a mythological and a magical bent much like the Freemasons or the Odd Fellows. It is, it's intergenerational. It's 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 people of all genders, people of all races, people of so different social backgrounds. It's it's their actual lives and interactions and how they come together at this lodge. And the 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 working undercurrent of the whole show is like I'm watching this right with magic brain. And stuff starts to happen and there's mystery and there's intrigue and there's plots and someone's got to go overseas and investigate. And I'm sitting there like, okay, this has got to be it. This has got to be where the show reveals that magic is real in this world on the show. Like, okay, this one's got to be a true coincidence. This one's got to be the rare manuscripts. And then you just keep finding out that there are actually fairly mundane explanations behind all of this <laughs> incredibly magical stuff that keeps happening. It's just, it's the most wonderfully evocative, like, I, the whole time, I wanted to cry after, like, the first five minutes. I'm just like, this is normal people doing, doing normal people magic. You know what I mean by normal people magic? <laughs> it's a normal people magic show. And it made me so happy. And then there was one other thing that is really recent that I loved, which is an Australian show. It's a mini series. I think it's four miniseries episodes maybe australian show from a few years ago called lambs of god have you seen this 
No. All right. So, Googling some shit again. So, <laughs> lambs of God. When I, this is what I mean when I say I'm a really big dork about the sorcerous media options. Uh, lambs of God is an Australian miniseries that was on a few years ago that takes place at, uh, at a archaic sort of con- rundown, dilapidated, pre-medieval convent on an island, as convents are, or whatever, in some instances. And the women who are nuns and sisters and devotees of like a Virgin Mary cult who live on this island doing various forms. They're doing like Virgin Mary veneration in this convent cult while doing various forms of practical alchemy, including and especially the tending of sheep for the making of yarn and dyeing of wool. So it has to do with the the three sisters, the dye staff, the spinning the wool, the alchemical dyeing, it's fairy tales, it's archety- it's like, and it's like a murder mystery kind of, it's like, <laughs> it's not explained. but basically Virgin Mary veneration cult alchemical knitting, like watch the show. <laughs> so these are, <laughs> you don't, I feel bad saying negative things about anything. I don't mean this in a negative way. I don't mean you don't have to watch Sabrina like that because I'm sure Sabrina's great. I have not gotten around to it yet. I have to have a big thing. I enjoyed it. I'm yeah. sure it's I, cool. I've yeah, heard a lot of people say it's really it. fun. I also love Satan so much. I love Satan so, so, so much. And I love Satan. <laughs> the history of Satan in pop culture is just the, the sweetest yeah. thing in my world. But like, you don't only have to watch that. There are actually really cool depictions of things like Virgin Mary veneration, convent cults, and the alchemical history of fairy tales happening on modern TV like now. So that's the thing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and, um i found sabrina to be a lot of fun i really enjoyed coven um from american horror story uh, i don't like this is where i get bitchy and it's weird too because i'm not a grimoire kind of practitioner such as yourself i'm not interested necessarily in my own practice and those sorts of things i really plug in deeper to like northern mythology and those sorts of things and uh but I get upset when I think the devil is being portrayed in a shitty way on TV or in a movie. I don't like cheesy yeah. devils. I like badass devils. <laughs> I mean, give me a cheesy devil. Don't give me don't give me a devil on the margins for no reason and I'm good. Don't make the villain someone don't make the villain the only different quote unquote person in the cast. Stop making the devil gay. <laughs> That's <I don't, laughs> No, make that shirt too. Stop making Satan gay. And I, and I say that as a gay person. <laughs> like, the, pink, the pink washing of villains in our culture, that that old chestnut from the beginning of time of the, the growing up, like, you know, there was some good talk on the internet about this very recently about like, why are all James Bond villains dressed all flashy? And why why does, you know... Uh, why does every character played by Alan Rickman have long hair that he flips around? Well, because we queer wash our villains, right? But like, mm. not making Satan gay. That's so silly. You don't have, that's not the way to differentiate it. That's a very old trope and it's very, very boring. Make him a BP executive. Make him an elected official. Don't make him gay. Make him boring. Yeah. Make him boring. There make you go. <laughs> Do something fun for yeah. once. That, that that brings to mind a couple questions. Um, I you say I love Satan so much, so I guess this is a, this is a two part question in a way. Satan and Lucifer for you are these the same energetic forces, same beings, and how? Regardless of that answer, how is um, I guess how is Satan a part of your practice, if it if at all? Oh, this is a nice question. So the first part is really hard. And the answer, I think, I think the answer is that the answer is totally different depending on where you're standing. Um, There's, of course, like the linguistic history of both. There's the analysis of the first appearances of the word Satan or Hasatan that people go into a lot of the time, like the various discursive meanings behind the word. And then there's the way that, like, from one angle, okay, there's Satan and then there's Blake's Lucifer, and then there's the Lucifer that is the band Lucifer's Friend, 
you know, like the Frodo Sykes metal band. And then there's people, there's plenty of people out in the world who believe Satan and Lucifer are the same thing. So even if I don't, that's an energy that exists and that can be keyed into if you so choose. So like, I think that uh, it can be very different depending on where you're coming at it from, what role, <laughs> what role Satan <laughs> plays in your life. Um, I think knowing when to distinguish and knowing what angle to come from is really important. I think Satan is fascinating. I've read a zillion books about Satan and depictions of the devil and our understanding of the devil and folklore of the devil and this, that, and the other thing. And if there's one thing, yeah, like the idea of, I'm at the point in the bell curve where I simply can't answer that question <laughs> in personal terms. That's fair. Um, <laughs> I hope that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I think like, like if I have a statue in my apartment and you could argue that in that per one art, object that matters to me somebody might walk into my house and call it satan somebody else might walk into my house and assume it's lucifer and think that that's different from so okay cool cool i'm not that worried the energy's there either way personally and depending on what i'm doing also just like coming from a grimoire angle like you're distinguishing a lot of the time so depending on what you're doing you may be forced to distinguish um so yeah i think learn a lot about satan and and keep your options open <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe that's like, maybe, I don't know. I can't say that that would be the same for everyone, but I think like that, well, okay. I don't know. Feeling called, up, called upon to, to discuss my love of Satan. I don't know. I can't say that this would be the case for everybody, but I think that it's starting to find a million ways to answer that question and to be able to take that question in about a million different directions and talk to you for about two hours, no matter which road we decided to take is a beautiful, like, thing I can display here at the part of the path that I am on in terms of my love of and work with Satan. So like how does Satan fit into my practice? Um, well, I think maybe the most interesting way, <laughs> maybe it's not the most interesting, maybe it's the least interesting, but it's the one I'll say, um, is that Satan enthralled me from really early on, right? And so like, when you first start learning about witchcraft, even when you're a little tiny kid and you're learning about the history of the Salem witch trials, one of the first things you learn, and this is like, whether you're raised Christian or not, or whatever your background is, you've probably got a devil. If there's any spirituality in your life, you're aware of the devil. The devil starts showing up in stories for kids really early in and out of religion. A lot of fairy tales have a devil character, a trickster character, devils in the Powerpuff Girls cartoons, right? So there's the, the devil in the movie and cartoons and everything. So the devil gets you really early when he gets you. And especially That's because true. even as a really young kid, I was really into rock and roll, right? And so you really young start to learn, you know, rock and roll and Satanism and rock and roll and Satanism. And my dad was super into music. I've talked a lot before about like me coming up in a household where I was on stage doing theater and, you know, you're doing theater on one hand, you're reading plays, you've got all these depictions of things. And then on the other hand, you've got literature and you've got music and there's all this, you know, Satan is everywhere. And for me, it's like the late eighties, early nineties. So the satanic panic's a bit over, there's dungeons and dragons, you know, you start to see Satan really, really young. And then you, if you start to get into witchcraft, you start to hear, you know, again, from that historical perspective, you learn about the witch trials, you learn about devil worship and then someone else will say well which you know it, it is the 90s in my childhood witches didn't worship the devil they worshiped the earth mother goddess okay well that sounds different where'd satan go can i go to his party because that sounds <laughs> fun. they were dancing the music's your, better your thing i know sounds this to be true <laughs> yeah your thing, sounds good for hip, your, your thing is for hippies but slayer is singing about satan and slayer sounds really good so like <laughs> let's do it right and so like satan grabbed me pretty much like we can look at the satanic panic and be like that is absolute nonsense <laughs> and like uh <laughs> rock and roll doesn't convert children to like devil worship but i actually pretty much stand assured in my spot here as like a well-adjusted 33 year old as maybe like the one time that did absolutely happen because rock and roll introduced me to like the form of satan that is among those that i still love today which is this idea that the devil has always existed throughout history it is as old an archetype as God. It may as well be up next to God, like the two are on the scoreboard next to each other in nearly every historical text. It's what keeps people at bay. It's what keeps people, Satan is, the fear of Satan is what keeps people in line in a lot of ways. 
then you start to read into it a little bit and you find out that Satan gets blamed for just about everything cool. And I'm also coming from a place where even if it wasn't the background that I was directly raised in, the place where I'm from geographically is like, we're talking everything from Mennonites to militant Pentecostals speaking in tongues to snake handling churches, right? So like we have some crazy, amazing forms of syncretic Christianity where I'm from. But of course, I get really excited about snake handling churches. The people at the snake handling churches probably aren't that excited to see me. <laughs> so like, I'm really, I'm like, oh, do your, do your fringe Christianity. I would love to stand with snake, buddy. I'm in. I love Satan. And they're like, wait, er, what? <laughs> Satan like, wait a minute. <laughs> right. Satan is in, in one form, one way that Satan plays into my practice that I absolutely love thinking about talking about is this idea of Satan as a perpetual philosophical and cultural force that keeps other people at bay. And if I could just maybe sidle up, I can get a Satan empowers you with an understanding of what other people are afraid of. Satan lets you understand fear. And so that's really cool. Satan, Satan keeps whole or is supposed to keep whole cultures at bay satan will also uh give you fair warning like seek satan around things that are fun and dangerous look for satan as a beacon of like i should be careful around these things you know also satan satan is a name often chanted from that's one of those like uh how to how to spot your enemies from a distance kind mm -hmm. of people. if i ever hear somebody yelling about satan my ears are going to perk up and i'm going to be very aware of that person you know, there's a lot of ways that Satan can come into it. But I personally, yeah, I find the observation of the cultural presence of Satan definitely factors into my my life and my belief system very heavily as a rock and roller. What is it about the power of the devil that has collected around rock and roll and guitar music? There's such an expansive history. And it's, it's of course, it's bound up on every level of culture. Like, the, it cannot be denied that rock and roll comes from black culture it cannot be denied that the earliest mythology of going down to the crossroads to talk with the devil about getting way better at shredding sweet guitar solos comes from black American music or yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like all of this, you can follow the, tr you can follow Satan through the history of humanity and you can very specifically like put your headphones on and let Satan be your guided recorded museum tour through the history of music in the West. And that's a very fascinating current to key into. Yes. What an excellent way to put that. Um, one of my favorite, we were talking about a statue and it brought to mind, uh, Jason Miller wrote, I think in one of his blog posts or a newsletter one time, uh, to make an offering to Lucifer, to go into a Catholic church and to the statue that's usually depicted of Michael with his yeah. throat, on the throat of Lucifer, but to realize that perhaps that's Lucifer winking about to get up and reverse the tide of that fight. And I, I just love the imagery that brings to mind. Yes, I love that. And I actually, I loved um, that specific piece of writing from Jason Miller, now that you mention it. Um, this is something that I read about that was really cool that actually spurred some really fascinating conversation. I got this buddy who is a great teacher of mine and a wonderful human being. His name is Brother Hoodoo Moses. And he's, he's a fabulous teacher and a wonderful person to follow. And he and I have a particular back and forth that we're always debating about the relationship between uh, the Archangel Michael and Satan. And we talk about this a lot. I have always perceived, because, okay, so maybe this after I go off on one of my men, you have to imagine me wearing the frock coat of a circa 1790s, like, Beau Brummel when I'm expostulating about my love <laughs> of Satan, right? But you also got to understand, like, I also work with the Archangel Michael constantly and at the same time. And, like, that is something that matters to me a lot. And one came after the other. Like, my work with Archangel Michael is not as recent, as, or uh, is far more recent from the beginning of my work in, with the, the satanic currents and stuff like that. But what you see in that famous depiction is both ends of the boundary being required in order for the opposite to exist. The infamous depiction of the Archangel Michael with his foot on Satan, it is the, I get the same energy from that as I do from the historically important photograph of Marina Abramovic and Ule doing the performance where he's pulling back a bow and arrow aimed directly into the center of her chest and only by finding a perfect physical balance between them can they lean back both 
balancing without shooting the arrow and killing her. That's what that statue looks like to me. It's the absolute necessity of extremity at both ends to have balance in the middle. And so I loved that piece by Jason Miller. I do, I think about that a lot, that, right. that classic depiction. And also, I, I, w- I wish to retract my statement. You can make your icons of that fight between the Archangel Michael and Satan as gay as you want. I think you should make them gayer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I respect it. <laughs> I respect it. Make them more, yeah. make those more cute. They're good. Yeah, make, make those more cute. Make them gayer. Make those well, gayer. well said. Gayer. Yeah. I really like that. <laughs> I love right. that because that's Quick. that's really really good, and that's also like I think because if we look at that idea of like okay, if we want to put a disco ball over Satan in our culture, and if we want to make the stupid arguments I'm usually railing against about homosexuality being a sin and South Park making Satan gay and this that <coughs> and the other thing, like okay, cool, strike a balance. If there's this idea of the Archangel Michael as being the ultimate empowered thing. And with the sword, you know, the flaming blue sword, and we go out there and we do our thing, and only Michael is strong enough and presumably manly enough to defeat the devil, who is often, if we want to talk about the crossover between Satan and Lucifer, we can throw in, like, misaligned ideas about Baphomet in there. But there is that idea, of, in, in the, like, Lucifer sense, if we're talking about that Beau Brummel stereotype, right, the femininity of Lucifer, we have Lucifer and Venus connections, we have not the triumph of masculinity over femininity, to put it in absolutely stupid binaristic terms, but the necessity of both for balance in the Archangel Michael and Lucifer. So, you know, as a queer person, make gayer statues, find the balance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love that. I love that. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, quick time check. How are we doing? What do we got left? I can talk for probably 10 more minutes. Is that cool? All right then we are going to go skip into the Patreon portion so they have something to feast upon. Nice. Please, real quick, tell everybody where they can find you, Meredith. All right. I am only a couple of places on the internet, but they're easy to find. I am at Graves Meredith on Instagram and Twitter. And if you are an occult or witchy or otherwise artist who is thinking about funding or support for your creative work you can find me at kickstarter.com slash music perfect okay thank you again for being here um we're on a time crunch folks so we're going to shoot over to the patreon portion uh thank you for tuning in as always stay weird out there my friends thank you for having me this has been a blast awesome all right now we're into the bonus audio First question in bonus audio land is what famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions, magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weirdwebradio you can find me on facebook as weirdwebradio or come join the new fun and exciting weirdwebradio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends 